And here's some questions and answers. Okay, reader asks, can I get some more videos? Well, I thank you for the vote of confidence. Yeah, these telescope reviews, they take a long time. If you don't believe me, try it sometime. You've got to do a lot and you need clear skies and you have to develop your thoughts. So what I like to do when I do a telescope review is have it for one lunar cycle. That is two weeks with the moon and two weeks without the moon. If it's cloudy at the wrong time, you can easily run into two months before you get a telescope review out. So if you're looking for more reviews of mine, go to scopereviews.com. I should probably say that a little bit more often. I just assume everybody knew. What I'm doing here is nothing new. I've been doing this for 25 years. Okay, reader asks, what do you think about these star naming services? Yeah, you know, I thought we'd put this away a long time ago, but apparently these companies are coming back. So just to repeat, the stars were named by the IAU, that is the International Astronomical Union. It was formed in 1919, and the stars were named shortly thereafter. And that's pretty much it. That's the end of the story. If somebody who comes around and offers to sell you a star or rename a star on behalf of somebody, it has no more validity than if you took a piece of parchment and ran it through your printer. So the problem is that this is usually done with the best of intentions. And if you hang around in this hobby long enough, this is an issue you are going to have to confront at some point. You know, a few years ago I had a guy come up to me at a star party with a piece of paper in his hand and tears in his eyes and he told me just a horrible story about his daughter and what happened to her and he said, could you please show me her star? I just bought it. And he handed me the piece of paper and I did not immediately recognize the constellations on it until I realized that I had been holding the piece of paper upside down. Yes, that's right. They had sold him a star in the Southern Hemisphere. It was in the constellation of Apis, the bird. You can't see Apis from the Northern Hemisphere. And the star naming service knew that. I fumbled through some explanation for him and then I kind of sent him on his way. Well, later that evening he came back and he said, you know what? He'd sobered up quite a bit. He said, uh, I've been kind of suspicious of this thing the whole time. And he thanked me for being honest with him and he also thanked me for not being too judgmental with him. So. There's a situation where it worked out. Uh, our club seems to be evenly divided on this. Um, what do you do? There are people who say, look, it's just not worth it. Uh, just let it go. There are other people who say, look, if you don't say anything, these star naming companies are going to continue to proliferate. So I don't know, what do you guys do? I do want to point out that if you're looking to do something with your money on behalf of somebody, there are many wonderful charities out there working, doing some important work. I might suggest that is a better place for your dollars than a star naming service. Okay, Ed, is it possible to make money on telescopes and are telescopes good investments? Uh, I don't think so, not for the most part. Every once in a while you hear of somebody making a lot of money on something that's pretty rare, like an astrophysics refractor. Uh, but I, I think if you're going to get into this hobby to try to turn a profit on it, you're going to have a rough time. I don't know, maybe somebody out there is doing it. I have never been able to figure out how to do that. By the way, if you're looking for an estimate as to what a used piece of equipment go for, I have a really general rule of thumb. I take the retail price and I multiply by 0.7. Then I kind of look at the number and see if it makes sense. If it's a common inexpensive item that's always in stock, I may adjust that number down a little bit. If it's something that's, you know, more rare, high end, I may adjust that number up a little bit. It doesn't work all the time, but it gets you in the ballpark. I use that 0.7 figure. Okay, Ed, when are you going to review those two old Mead white reflectors behind you? Yeah, there's been some interest in those, and I'm going to get around to this. This one over here is my original telescope from 1981. It is a Mead model number 591, and I had no money at the time. I was a teenager, and I took a job at a fast food restaurant. At a time when minimum wage was $325, I was making $285 an hour, and I wasn't making any tips. So by the time I got done paying my taxes and paying gas and so forth, uh, it took me a long time to save up for that thing. 
So the other one is an eight inch. That's for those of you who know, it's a Mead model number 856. And those of you who follow me know that I think Mead reflectors from that late 70s to early 80s time frame are some of the most beautiful telescopes ever made and that one is no exception. So I actually found that thing in a pawn shop outside of Boston. The guy didn't know what it was. I kind of talked him down on the price because it has some condition issues and it's missing a few parts and the secondary spider was broken. That was a couple of years ago. I just recently had somebody local fix the secondary spider for me, so now it is fully operational. Yes, I've had it for a couple of years. I've never looked through it. I'm going to remedy that very shortly, and we'll see if we can do a review on that one. Okay, Ed, anything ever unusual happen to you while you're taking one of those video captures on the moon or the planet? Yes, this happened several years ago. I'm gonna go ahead and play this. You have to look fast because obviously this was unplanned. Okay, reader asks, Ed, what are the two sharpest and least sharp telescopes that you own? That's a good question. Well, the sharpest telescope I own is a pretty easy pick here. It is this, it's my Takahashi FS60. I don't know what Takahashi does with these refractors. It seems like each one I look at is better than the next. Okay, so the second sharpest telescope I have is my other Takahashi FS60. Yes, I have two of them. So I have one of these set up for visual and one of them for imaging purposes. The reason I have two of these is at one point I was going to do a digital all sky survey of the night sky. I was going to take a picture of the entire sky with a telescope. And when you're doing a project like this, it helps to have two identical setups. Never got around to starting that. I may take up that project again at another time. By the way, if you're just getting started, don't buy one of these. <laughs> They're totally impractical. They don't gather any light. The focuser travel is very short and it's sometimes hard to find focus with things and uh, the sticker shock is going to get to you. So if you're just starting out, stay with the standard recommendations. The eight inch Dobsonian is of course a terrific place to begin your journey in this hobby. Okay, so the second worst telescope I own is this. It's my six inch F5 Orion Newtonian. I took this off of one of their six inch star blast telescopes. And as you can see, the tubes all scratched up and the focuser got replaced because the original one broke. These six inch F5 tubes are sold under a number of different manufacturers. I've seen a few of them. I can't really say that any of them have been all that great, although some are better than others. But I will say this. This particular sample is the worst one of these I've ever seen. It starts getting soft around 40 or 50 power. Looking at the planets is out. Double star splitting is out. I keep it around for star parties. I use it on an Altaz mount. I keep it at very low power and I keep it low to the ground for kids. So the worst telescope I own is going to surprise you. Okay, so in case you don't know what this is, this is a vintage Unitron 4-inch F15 refractor. Its model number is 152. Unitron doesn't exist anymore, so these are considered vintage and collectible telescopes, and they are actually very sought after by collectors. I have seen clean used samples of one of these selling for many thousands of dollars. This one isn't worth that much. It's got some condition issues and it's missing some pieces. So. The Unitron Corporation telescopes were known not only for their optical e excellence, but for their beautiful industrial design. I have this thing set up in this room, and whenever somebody comes over, they always ask about it. Optically, there is clearly something wrong here. Something is going on. I can't put my finger on it. I've been in touch with Unitron experts across the country, and they are placing this sample somewhere in the 1957 to 1963 time frame. For those of you who know such things, the tube is the heavier version that is made of brass. There are bubble levels on both axes. The focuser is labeled D100 millimeters, focal length 1500 millimeters. There are no markings at all on the lens cell and the lenses appear to be uncoated and the spacers are intact. I don't know what's going on here. This is not sharp at any power. Some people told me that uh, it was fashionable for a while for people to disassemble the lens cell and clean them for some reason and for whatever reason they put them together incorrectly and it resulted in some bad looking optics. 
Maybe that's what happened here. I don't know. All I know, this telescope right now is unusable at any magnification. So at some point, I'll get the guys in here and maybe we'll take that thing apart and we'll try to figure it out. So this story's not over, so stay tuned. Okay, and finally, I sometimes get asked, what are these prints on the wall behind me? Well, these are astrophotographs of mine that I've had blown up. And the one on your left is the Orion Nebula. I took that through the astrophysics Riccardi Honders. No, I don't have one of those. I have a friend who owns one and sometimes he lets me use it. This is a stack of about 130 images of various types, lights, darks, flats, and so forth. So the image on your right here is a composite of nine clear nights on the moon. We had an outstanding July of 2018 where I had nine clear nights of clear phases on the moon like this. This was taken through my Takahashi FC76. Each one of those images is a stitch of two to four individual frames put together. I took the nine images and laid them out like this in Photoshop. So if you look carefully on this image, there's actually some damage on the lower right hand side. You'll see a little bit of rippling there. The person at the graphic arts company who did this for me left it in his car in the summertime before the adhesive had cured and so it left these sort of waves in it. So they made me another one but they were nice enough to let me keep this one too. So this is the one that I hang up and the other one I have in storage in case I have to show it at an art gallery or something like that. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.